Um, hello. Seems like it was just recently I saw you guys. <laughs> but I'm glad we're still doing this after one week. Uh, so welcome back for part, what, three or part four? I don't know. I lost count. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm uh, Dr. Obi. And I think I know everybody, but I could be wrong. For those who missed this, and I don't know if I should, well, I guess some of you, those who were here last time knew we didn't finish on the nephritic, nephritic syndromes we were talking about. And um, I, I kind of wanted to rush down to where we stopped, if that's okay. I'm sure some people didn't see this, but uh, uh, maybe we'll catch up another time. But let's go back to where we stopped. We talked about a lot of things that uh, I'm sure you all remember all we talked about. Uh, um, Glomerular nephritis is um, something that y you just have to uh, keep reviewing time to time. You never really remember everything. Even for those of us that practice this for a living, uh, still some diseases are so rare that you still have to go back and kind of review. So don't feel bad if you don't remember everything, uh, which I expect you to. <laughs> but uh, uh, I think we stopped. Uh, let me find where we stopped. See all the things you missed if you were not here? Uh, oh, okay. This was the guy who stopped that. Lupus. So if, if, you, if you missed every other thing else, you should be glad you didn't miss this one because I think in, you will run into lupus. It's, it's very common. And, um, but lupus nephritis as an entity in particular is also common with systemic lupus disease. Um, in fact, about 50% prevalence, so up to half of the people that have lupus at some point in their disease will have renal involvement, which is what you call lupus nephritis. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that you, you, you have to keep an eye out for it. And most rheumatologists, uh, you hope every lupus patient is under the care of rheumatologists, but every rheumatologist that cares for lupus would be looking out for this. So lupus, actually, uh, we know you don't, we don't really know all the things that account for why people get lupus, but it's all of environmental factors. And <laughs> the major key player is that there's a defect in your self antigen recognition. So your ability to recognize what's self and not self. And once that happens and you, there's a defect with that recognition, then you begin to develop autoantibodies that will eventually account for all the manifestations of lupus that you see. So, uh, but what exactly triggers of what? We really don't know. So let's talk about lupus nephritis. Like I said, lupus nephritis is renal involvement with lupus. A and already I'm throwing out a classification, and this is the most recent classification we have for lupus uh, that was put out by the International Society of Nephrologists and uh, Renal Pathologist Society. Things was done in 2003. And it kind of slowly replaced the WHO classification for lupus, but it, you can, you can see there are six different classifications, or rather classes of how lupus can affect your kidney. Now, this classification is only limited to glomerular involvement. Now, as you know, your kidney does not just have glomerular. <laughs> it has other compartments to it. It has the tubular and testicular compartment. It has the vascular compartment. But the classification that we use is predominantly describing what pathologists will see in the glomerular. There's other classifications people have for tubular interstitial disease also, but those have not gained steam like the classifications for glomerular, inv glomerular involvement, okay? So, uh, I know you guys know all these classifications by heart. I'm not sure if I ask you, just, just rattle it. But for class one and class two, essentially what you're looking at is mild lupus nephritis. Now, this does not have anything to say about the systemic lupus they have. In fact, people can have severe systemic lupus nephritis and, sorry, sy systemic lupus erythematosus, but don't really show you that kind of degree of involvement in the kidney. So don't base your judgment, oh, it's lupus so bad, it must be kidney, no. You see, there's class one and class two, which are kind of what we call the milder involvement, in which you just have in class one, just minimal messenger deposits, so that's what you find. When you look at the kidney on a light microscope, when you take a biopsy, you pretty much don't see too much from normal, it looks almost normal. However, when you look on the EM, electron microscopy, you will find some subtle deposits that will tell you that there's been some lupus, uh, deposit of lupus, immune complex deposit in the, in, the, in the mesangium of the kidney. 
Then class two is just when those deposits are a little bit more, there's some mesangial proliferation. So you start seeing more cells in the mesangial area of the kidney. And then, uh, but for those two, as you'll find later, I'll tell you, uh, we call them kind of mild. And the treatment will, will bear witness to how mild they look. Then when you go to class three and class four, you now begin to have some more deposits of immune complexes in the kidney. And depending on how extensive the involvements are with the glomerula, you can then class them into class three or to class four. And if you look at all those uh, letters they have there, like active, chronic, AC, chronic, uh, or active, those are dependent on what the pathologist, how the pathologist view the slides. If there's evidence of endocapillary proliferation uh, such that they think that this is an active disease, uh, they will use the word active to let you know that this disease is causing ongoing damage. And, but if those are burnt out and have already scarred up that glomerular to the point where there's the damage is done, they will use the word chronic. So you can have a class three, which is involvement of less than 50% of the glomerular that can be active, it can also be chronic. You can also have a class four, which is when you have more than 50% of the glomerular involved. So if you get a glomerular or, or if you get a biopsy and you look at all the glomerular you see, there's so many of them you see, if there's less than 50% of, say you have 10 glomerular you see there, um, uh, if, if four is involved, okay, you might say it's class three because it's less than 50%. If you have six to 10 of all involved, then you can say, oh, class, this is class four lupus, uh, meaning that there's a lot of uh, uh, involvement. And then in the diffuse lupus involvement, which is class four, you can actually have segmental involvement. So you take 10 glomeruli you see, and you start looking inside the glomerular top. You might see segments of that glomerular involved. So maybe out of the 10 you have, there's segments of it, not the whole glomerular involved, but segments of that glomerul glomerulus that you look at involved with some activity. So you can have a diffuse global or diffuse segmental. Um, then you go to class five, which is a different uh, animal of its own, because class five lupus is pretty much membranous. It's like membranous disease because the immune complexes are depositing in the glomerular basement membrane. And um, they, they, they behave a little bit differently from the traditional bad boys, class three and class four. That's the group that if you see a class three diagnosis or class four, you have to pull out all your guns for five because that's the one that will cause significant damage and progress to part of the end stage renal disease if you leave it. Then class six is actually when you have a kidney that's already toast, it's all square roots and damaged, but then you get a biopsy at that late end, and there's evidence that there was some immune complex injury resulting, causing that scarring. And in that, those people are pretty much 90% square roots glomerula, and they're progressing to end stage renal disease. But just for diagnosis sake, you have to label them as class six, where you say they're square roots disease, okay? All right, we're moving. So these diagnoses, these classifications have kind of have some uh, therapeutic implications, like, like I said, class one and two is mild. And I have pictures to show. So unfortunately, it's not showing so well. But if you could see, I guess this is working. OK. So if you could see the degree, now you can see, just look at the immune complex. I have immune fixation stains here. You can tell you this is class one with just a little bit mild stuff. The pattern of staining is just mild. And class two, a little bit more. You see some things, but it's more in the mesangium. And the mesangial part is just this broadish area. If it was a rule, the glomeruli, like you see in class four here, you're going to see holes. It's the whole glomeruli plus mesangium, all with deposits. In class three, is in between, as you can see, a little bit more than this, but it, it, it's not as diffuse as class four. And then in class six, the damage has been done, but this kidney has evidence that's been deposited there. But if you really look at it, the light microscopy and some other stains, you'll find that it's totally sclerosed kidney, uh, glomeruli. And these are cartoon pictures of what has happened, the degree of deposits they have. In group, it shows you that it increases the stages worsen. Okay? Um, all right, let's move a little faster. So how do we watch for lupus nephritis, or who do we think is developing lupus nephritis? Um, if you're seeing rheumatologists, usually they're the ones that people see with lupus, and they eventually end up seeing nephrologists. Typically, when you have SLE, the rheumatologists manage them. Once they start getting to lupus nephritis, kind of transfer care to, to the nephrologists, most of them will. Some still treat themselves. 
So proteinuria is the big hallmark. So every time you go, they're always collecting their urine, protein creatine ratios, and they're checking 24-hour urine. If you develop more than 500 grams of, of uh, 500 uh, uh, milligrams, sorry, uh, or 0.5 grams of uh, protein in your urine, that's kind of a cue that something is happening. You're spinning protein. For them, then they now try to look if see if there's any activity. Is this urine sediment active? Is there cellular cast or uh, of all types of things? Hemoglobin, red cells, granular cast. You look for cast if you can find them. And then most of those people, if you look at their complementing uh, C3 and C4 in active class three or class four lupus, typically when there is an proliferative component to lupus, you will have low C3 and C4. Uh, it's a good thing to before your board exam to go and check all the diseases that cause low C3 or C4. Because those board people like to bring out those questions. So just know lupus is one of them. C3, C4, low in lupus, okay? Except in class five. So you can have membranous lupus and you could have normal C3, C4. That's another caveat. And of course your ANAs and anti-double-stranded uh, DNA uh, is positive. So you kind of guess. But but the, the hallmark is beginning of proteinuria. Once it starts in proteinuria, that's the cue. Everybody starts looking for all these other things, okay? Now, usually you have to, uh, let's talk about treatment because I'm, I'm jumping so I can get some things done quickly. Um, so class one and class two lupus, like I said, is mild. In our mind, the, the primary care doctor, the rheumatologist, they typically manage those ones. You have to control the systemic lupus as much as you can with the medicines you use for those, your plaquenils, their whatever. Usually it's plaquenil. And you try to control um, proteinuria, because you know they're spilling more than 500 milligrams of protein. So your ACE and ARB, the general control of blood pressure, those things are the hallmark of therapy in class one and class two. You typically don't use immunosuppressive agents at those stage of lupus manifestation. Uh, uh, so those ARBs, and then you watch them. The thing about lupus is that we kind of know that lupus can switch classes on you. So somebody might start with class one and class two, and along the line, if their lupus flares more or gets more involved with their kidney, they could flip from class one or class two to class three or class four, and down the stream till they progress. So you still watch them closely. You hope their proteinuria stays stable, their kidney function looks stable, their creatinine is not trending up, and as long as you have ACE and ARB, that's all you do for class one and class two. Now when you get over to class three and to five, usually three and four, the big bad boys, y you really have to hit hard because those have shown that the progression to end stage is very high. The scarring, the inflammation, the immune complex destruction of the glomeruli will continue if, if, you don't, if you don't treat them. Now don't be fooled. A lot of class three, class four patients will show up to your doorstep, active lupus, that stage, and their creatinine is normal. See them all the time. So don't expect to see creatinine is rising like crazy. No. The damage is happening. That's why we use biopsy. You have to biopsy to know what stage. If you suspect there's proteinuria, there's active sediment, you biopsy because we've been surprised at what we found. Some people look so well and you don't think they have any flow of their lupus, but in their kidney, there's significant damage going on. So class three, class to five, what do we use? Well, typically, and I don't think you need to know all the technical details of treatment, but the big medicines we have for lupus pretty much fall into uh, your cytoxin, which is your cyclophosphamide, uh, as your immunosuppression, or your cell cell, your microphenolate. Now, the evolution of treatment has changed, and I don't expect you all to know that, but there's a lot of move from, cell, from cytoxin now towards cell cell as your me medication for treatment, for induction and, uh, and the maintenance of lupus. Uh, and I don't know how much you expect you to know that, but I think it suffice for you to know that you use cytoxin and cell cell as your major medicines for immunosuppression. You also have to manage proteinuria with your uh, blockade medicine, your renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system blockade. You have to, the RAS system. You still have to add those medicines as much as possible to control proteinuria. And then you watch. Watch closely because like every treatment, you can respond. For the most part, most respond. But some people can can uh, fail to respond. So you can have complete remission or incomplete or no response at all. And you change modality as you see fit, uh, uh, depending on how they respond. Now, other medicines have been added. Some people um, have tried things like Rituxan, 
uh, which is still out there for when people fail with response to traditional medicine. People have added those type of medicines on board. But uh, typically the treatment is induction with cytoxin or with cell cell, and then you maintain them. Uh, and prednisone, clearly, corticosteroids, I should not forget to mention, you have to have corticosteroids with that combination. And then you, you maintain them with either this microphenolate steel or your azotyrapine. Some have used your, um, your calcineurin inhibitors. I'm just throwing out what we use because I, I don't know that it'd be fair to expect you to know the details of how we use them. Um, all right. That's the skinny or meet and greet on lupus. I know there are more questions you might have, but le let me move on to other things we want to talk about. Now, the um, anti-GBM uh, disease is something that comes out in the board also. Your traditional goods pastures disease. Now, who knows the difference between goods pastures disease and goods pastures syndrome? Is there a difference? You're going to see it in your, in your literature, in your, in your textbook. All right. Well, I gave you one answer there. <laughs> you read it there. So your know, good pastures or anti-GBM. So anti-GBM is antibodies against the good medulla basement membrane. It's usually IgG or IgA sometimes. But it's, it's antibodies that target uh, a segment of the uh, chain of collagen in the, in the, in the um, good medulla basement membrane. And the GBM is made up of three, is a, is a helix of collagen uh, that is a triple helix that forms the basement membrane of, of glomeruli. You have the uh, type four collagens that, um, you have the type four collagen that's made up of the alpha three chain, alpha four chain, alpha five chain of type four collagen. Now, the alpha three chain is the culprit in anti-GBM. The antibody is targeting a segment of that alpha-3 chain. And usually that segment, if you read more textbooks about it, usually is kept away from self-recognition. In other words, it's hidden in the conformation of the proteins around it. It hides that antigen well from your antibodies recognizing it. But for some reason, whatever insult that glomeruli takes, it opens that antigen for expression. And once it's seen, your body says, hey, we don't know this guy. <laughs> and they feel that this is a strange part of your body. For whatever reason, something triggers that insult. And your body develops antibodies to them, and clearly those antibodies cause damage as they line up on the glomerular basement membrane and eventually trigger a disease, okay? Um, so the, the uh, type 4 collagen is found in other parts of your body, clearly. The lung, clearly, is a major area where you find type 4 collagen. And the, so the disease, when the antibodies form, can attack predominantly two organs, your lung and your kidney, where you have predominance of this type of collagen. Uh, and um, so you have disease, when you have pulmonary alveolar hemorrhage with rapidly progressing renal failure, which is what you find with this type of diseases, An anti-GBM falls into that class of renal failure that is rapidly progressing, and I'll tell you why soon. Um, and then you have positive anti-GBM. That is good pastures disease, if there is positive anti-GBM. So you hear pulmonorenal syndromes. Pulmonorenal syndromes typically are called good pastures syndrome. It's not only anti-GBM that will do good pastures syndrome. It's one of them. When you have positivity of anti-GBM, that's when it's called good pastures disease. Other things that do pulmonorenal syndrome is your anchor disease. Even your lupus can do pulmonorenal syndrome. So there are other entities that will do a pulmonary component and a renal component. But when you have positivity with anti-GBM in the system, it becomes good pastures disease. Okay? I've confused you all more, correct? All right. Anyway, passing by. All right, so you find that there's linear, uh, this is a hallmark of the disease, sorry. The, the immune, let's move this back. Okay, there you go. The, the immunofluorescent uh, staining is smooth and stains all around the glomerular. So you're going to see the holes. It's all completely around a glomerular uh, capillary bed. It's all around the capillaries. And this is smooth staining. And that's all. Once you see that, there's classically one disease that will do it in the setting of rapid kidney failure. And that's anti-GVM. 
Another disease can give you smooth stain, it can be diabetes, but it doesn't typically present rapid failure of the kidney. And people have diabetes, they know. But if you have this in a setting of rapid kidney failure, that is anti GBM must be proven otherwise, okay? And um, this disease is bad because this is, the this is the deadliest disease for the kidney in terms of how fast it can take you from I have no more kidney to end stage renal disease. This is number one lethal disease for the kidney, anti-GBM. It will knock that kidney out fast. Why? Because it produces crescentic disease that is active and it's like a nuclear bomb blows up in the kidney. It will damage that kidney fast. In fact, we had a case of um, usually people in their 80s, elderly folks, there was an 84-year-old lady that came in, family practice patient, and went to see her doctor like two weeks before. And they did labs after she came back from the repeat lab two weeks after. Creatinine gone from 0.9 to 6 in two weeks. And they called her to come in, and she said, no, nah, I feel fine. Nothing's happening. Two weeks later, creatinine had gone from 6 to 11. She shows up in the hospital, and pretty much we're talking dialysis at that point. That kidney just exploded and gone. And sure enough, we checked anti-GBMs, and uh, Gumerab, basement member antibody, Gumerab came back very high. So that's kind of how fast this stuff will progress. Now, the management of the disease typically is you watch for what's happening the most. Some people come in with coughing up blood, alveolar hemorrhage. They come in with bad, you, you guys might have seen some of them in the ICU. They have diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. They are, they, are, they are battling to survive. And in that picture, typically when we see hemorrhage, the treatment is get rid of the antibody. The antibody we know is the culprit with the disease. You have to get rid of it as fast. So the only way to do it is you either fluoresce it out, but you also have to stop production. So we give fluoresces to take out the antibodies, and then we we'll give cytotoxic, um, cytotoxic medications to suppress production of the antibody. Cytoxin is usually what we use, and it works for almost everybody. Fluoresces and cytoxin. If they have uh, the the two reasons why you fluoresce people with anti-GBM, one is if there's severe alveolar hemorrhage. Number two is they are becoming dialysis dependent. So if you see people getting on dialysis, that's it. You've got to fluoresce them. Steroids and cytotoxic uh, and cyclophosphamide for three to six months, uh, you don't even know the dose, uh, would work. And typically, this disease does not reoccur. So people don't relapse or reoccur. Typically, once you've done the treatment, they will do well. The problem is that you need to catch it early. If you don't catch it early or have a high suspicion that somebody coming with pulmonary, I'm coughing up blood, and hey, dog, and I'm, my, I'm not, you know, your kidney function is worsening. You will miss the time. Time is critical. And if once they get to the kidney dialysis point, forget it, that kidney is gone. And there's so many people that we see on dialysis that had anti-GBM and it just didn't save them. Okay? Um, you can get kidney transplants done, and usually it's usually after six months of being free from the antibody. All right, let's talk about anchor. Anchor vasculitis is also a small vessel vasculitis, and this also falls into the category of rapidly progressing glomerulonephritis. So what do I mean by rapidly progressing? It's something that hits your kidney. You see somebody's creatinine is just zoom, 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 moving up fast. People are losing kidney function rapidly. It's no time frame to it, really. Nobody's defined it that way. But we know that when somebody comes in and in the hospital admission, you're watching their creatinine just keeps rising uh, despite all you're doing. That's what we call rapidly. That kidney is being damaged kind of rapidly. So anchor disease is a uh, type, um, it's associated with positive anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody. That's what anchors are. Um, and uh, you guys know, I've heard of anchors, right? Who has not heard of anchor, A-N-C-A? Okay, well, let's explain. So these antibodies were, uh, and funny, it was Chapel Hill down the road there where they did all the studies on trying to isolate what anchors are. But it's antibodies to neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies. And we found that there are some small vessel vasculitis, uh, vasculitis inflammation of small vessels. As you know, there are several vessels that get involved, vasculitis, there's medium vessels, there's large vessels. But anchor vasculitis is a small vessel vasculitis that likes predominantly to affect vessels in the kidney as well as where <laughs> in the lungs. And typically is, uh, will cause kidney failure when they have affect the kidney. Uh, but they are associated with these antibodies that we can find in plasma, that is antibodies to neutrophil cytoplasmic anti uh, 
antigens in the, in the neutrophils, uh, 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 in the cytoplasm of neutrophils. And there are a bunch of them that we, you hear about, Wegners. Wegners is, has been the big name people hear, but it's changing. Uh, as you can see, there are new names for Wegners and, uh, and Chalk Strauss. The, the big, big boys in this anchor disease, Wegners, microscopic polyangiitis, and Chalk Strauss. And Wegners is now called granulomatosis with polyangiitis, or GPA, because the name is offensive to some category of people and decide it's time to change it. So the, uh, uh, you all don't know that. You know that story, that the Wegners guy was found to be anti-Semitic. And the people say, why are we promoting this guy's name everywhere? We need to change it. We don't like to call his name Wegners, whatever. Let's change it. And they voted. So now I have to start learning this longer granulomatosis with polyangiitis. But um, the more you say it, you, you get used to it. Um, so GPA, and then there's microscopic polyangiitis, and then there's the chalk strauss, which is now called isnophilia or isnophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis. These diseases are very, not say very common, but they are not too rare that we don't see them here. We see them all the time. The problem is that you have to have a high suspicion for this. Now, I'll tell you guys, because you're going to be practicing. When people come in saying, I'm having shortness of breath or chronic sinus problems or I'm coughing up blood, and, and the involvement in the pulmonary system can be subtle. Subtle as like people have rhinorrhea or they can have as bad as I'm coughing up blood. People always think you have to have pulmonary hemorrhage before you think of rapidly progressing glomerular nephritis. That's not true. The pulmonary involvement with these pulmonorenal syndromes can be as simple as Chronic sinus in Weg Wegners. Wegners is notorious. People have chronic sinusitis. Some come in with rhinorrhea. Some come in with a little short of breath when I walk around. Some come with pulmonary nodules that you see on their lung, on their chest x-ray that you can't explain. They're not smokers. They just have these nodules that are in there. It could be from nodules from plural space to lung space. Any type, uh, all kind of presentation. But when you see something in the pulmonary system, ranging from the sinus down to the lower pulmonary tract, that you don't expect to find in somebody. And, oh, by the way, their kidney function looks like it's not, it's worsening. I mean, worsening can be creatinine is rising. Or it could be that, oh, you check their urinalysis and they have blood in their urine. Blood in the urine is always suspect. If you find blood in a urine that you don't expect to find blood in, in other words, this is not traumatic, fully put, this is not fully, it's hanging there. There's no in and out cast. And you get a sample of urine and there's blood, too numerous to count blood, in a setting of a pulmonary involvement or I have sign. Always think something bad. That's how they present. And they come in here all the time. And we sit on these people, we send them out the UTI, we treat the UTI and send them out. And they come back next day, their creatine is what? 10. Or you have the guy who's being his primary care doctor for. Oh, I have this sinus that never goes away. And they be giving me all these antibiotics. It's been going on and going on. It did never went. Always worry that some of these people are presenting with a type of small vessel vasculitis that you need to look for. So if you see somebody in that picture, just get a urine specimen. If you see blood <laughs> or protein or something that makes you think, you know, why is this here? And you connect the dots. It could be pulmonary, it could be renal. Just go for it. You'll be surprised what you find. All right, so... Uh, Wegner's microscope polyangiitis, Chuck Strauss, I don't know how much details you need to know about this, but to suffice to say that they are all components of what you can find with anchor vasculitis. Um, there are other things, like I said, that can do pulmonorenal syndromes and immune complexes and oxaline, cryogram, uh, even lupus. Um, some of these things, because they have immune complexes, could occasionally have anchors with them, but they're not traditionally what you call anchor vasculitis. It's normally Wegner's microscopic polyangiitis and the chalk strauss, okay? Um, so anchors, well, like I told you, they're, they're predominantly um, antibodies to antigens in the, cy in the cytoplasm of, of, of uh, neutrophils. A and when you stay for them, it's not showing up very well. You have predominantly two that we talk about a lot, the P anchor and the C anchor. Now, the, the substrate for the P anchor which the P anchor just it means that when you stain with an ELISA stain, it's normally an ELISA stain they do. If you stain with an ELISA stain in the lab, what they, fi what they find is that there's a perinuclear staining of that ELISA stain around the nuclear of the neutrophil. So the, the predominance is around the nuclear. Every other thing here is empty. 
as opposed to the sea anchor where it's a cytoplasmic staining, it's more into the cytoplasm. And uh, there's some double accentuation that they talk about, but it's more cytoplasm, it's more there as opposed to perinifer. The antigen that you worry about that the anchors, the P anchor or the antibody itself is targeting this antigen called MPO. It's uh, myeloperoxidase in the neutrophils. That's what the antibody is targeting. And so this is staining those myeloperoxidase. And then the P anchor, sorry, that went back, is staining for the PR3. It's a proteinase 3. Oh, I take it back. I went far. Where did I go? All right, so it's staining for the PR3, which is proteinase 3 is the substrate for that antibody. Uh, I don't know that you need to know, but just know there's P anchor and, and, and uh, C anchor. The two di there's also a group that they call atypical anchor. Atypical means that some features of P and C there, they can call. It's neither, a, it's neither P, neither C, but. And then some, sometimes we don't even have anchor staining, but yet the disease is a small vessel vasculitis, and you will see that. It's kind of what you see in anchor disease. There's uh, just a cartoon picture. It's like a, another bomb explosion. It's crescentic disease. They damage the architecture or the cytostructure of the glomerular. So you have uh, these antibodies doing their thing, damaging the structure of that glomerular. And that becomes a crescent. And the crescent will cause damage to the kidney rapidly. Okay? Um, okay. Now, this is interesting because not all of our small vessel vasculitis would have positive anchor staining. It, we thought we could say slam dunk if there's anchor positivity. Yes, if you have it in the clinical picture where there's pulmonary and renal involvement, sometimes you can have just renal involved disease. But if you have positive anchors and the, synth the disease, the pattern of presentation fits, uh, then you can say that more likely this is what I'm dealing with. However, we find like in MPA, MPA is your microscopic polyangitis, you, you can find that they, they can have positivity for C anchor on 40%. They can have 50% of them. So MPA is usually more of P anchor. That's usually the hallmark. It's a P anchor disease, but it's 50%. But you can also have C anchor in 40%. So you find that the anchor type is not very, very specific for the type of disease itself. However, there's some, m m some of the disease present more with one particular type of anchor as opposed to the other. So MPA, microscopic polyangitis, will present more with P anchor as opposed to Wegner's or GPA as it, uh, is a new name is, that will present more with C anchor. So Wegner is a C anchor disease predominantly. So if you have a story and they're telling you and they tell, oh, by the way, the anchor is C anchor positive. You're thinking more that this might be classic Wegner. However, you notice that 5% is negative. So even in case where the story fits and the picture looks pulmonorenal and they say, oh, the anchor stain was pendant or negative, don't be fooled. You can have anchor negative. In 10% of MPG, MPA, it's negative. In 5% of Wegner's, it's negative. Same thing with Chuck Strauss. Chuck Strauss, typically more a P anchor disease, sorry, more, uh, well, if you classify P anchor as opposed to C anchor, but it can be negative in almost more than half of the case. Uh, that's helpful to know. So you hear us talk about anchor negative vasculitis. Does not mean that it's not Wegner's. Does not mean that it's not microscopic polyangitis. Does not mean that it's not Chuck Strauss. So clinical presentation, now this is the one that is the problem. It's so variable, the presentation, that nobody can come and tell you, hey, this is a cl classic. What you have to understand is that extreme age of age, Wegner's is a bimodal disease. You will see Wegner's present in the young people in their teenage to early 20s. You can have it. And then above 65, you see Wegner's. Those are typically the pattern with Wegner's disease. When you talk of MPA and Chuck Strauss, you typically talk about diseases that present in elderly population above 65 and above. It's usually you see them at that age. So if an elderly person is coming, says I'm coughing up blood, or by the way, there's chronic sinus problem that is new, or rhinorrhea, or by the way, my urine has blood in it, to take them serious. You need to worry because this stuff can be indolent, presents like nothing's happening, and then boom, it blows up on you. They start coughing up severe pulmonary alveolar hemorrhage. That can happen just like that. We've had people come in, looked okay, and come. In fact, what last month and a month and a half, 80, some 86-year-old lady came into the hospital service, and she came in why? Because her son brought her because she was having chronic sinus problem. Oh, well, by the way, she's having this elective surgery planned for in two weeks time, and we need to just get rid of this sinus before she goes for this surgery. So he brought her to MedDirect. 
And they showed up there, and she's kind of, you know, lady's not complaining of anything bad. You know, she's just sitting there. And she had pre-op labs done. Pre-op labs for the surgery that's coming up in two weeks' time. And just after prescribing the antibiotics, oh, the physician just clicked to see what the pre-op labs that were done two days before looked like. And the creatinine had gone from one to four. And they repeated it there in the ED, and it was back at 4.7. <gasps> of course, call nephrology. <laughs> <laughs> they sent her in and she called her for And lo and behold, she comes in sitting there and I said, oh, she's dehydrated. Oh, I just hydrate her, and, you know. And the story is looking at you. Chronic sinus, sinus that is coming up, there's news, is having rhino, rhinorrhea. And I creatinine has gone from one to four. And there's no reason. She's not dehydrated. She's not nausea, vomiting, no diarrhea. And you know, they're all looking at this. And then the nephrologist comes to the room. Sally, it was me. <laughs> And looked at her, and I said to her from ED, you have an anchor vasculitis. Just come in, let's start the steroid. Unfortunately, some of these send-out tests we do, the NPOs and anchor tests, take like seven days before they even make it to the hospital. And that's the time lag that is really hurting me because I wish we'd get the results sooner. Well, sadly, the lady came in, and interestingly in her lab, she had eosinophilia. So when you start seeing eosinophilia, what does it bring to your mind? What disease would that be? Chuck Strauss. And I don't have to tell you guys. So she had some eosinophilia in her labs. And she had classic Chuck Strauss because uh, a week before her labs, she had, been, she had a stress test to prepare for the surgery. And her stress test was positive for presumed ischemia. So the surgeon said, I'm still going to do surgery, but I won't put you under general anesthesia. How desperate. You want to do the surgery by all means, even the positive stress test, you had to do it. Anyway, in Chuck Strauss, that's the hallmark. There's a lot of cardiac involvement with Chuck Strauss kind of, they come in with positive nuclear stress tests, they have all this stuff. So that sets it apart, eosinophilia sets it apart in some, some positive cardiac marker. To cut this long story short, she died because everybody looking at her, she looked like she was doing fine and right in front, this lady went south. Pulmonary problems, dropped hemoglobin by, what, three grams, not in her stool, not in her urine. She bled into her lungs, just like that, and coded and died. And that's what the learning that this book can come in. If you don't think about it, uh, they move fast. And after she died, two days after, uh, Anka result comes back. <laughs> P Anka is off the chart. I'm like, crazy. Well, guess what? I've already left. I was just saw for one day, unfortunately. But you try to tell people, think fast. But sometimes we miss those opportunities. But a lot of your patients come in like this. Sorry. So why why bother? That's a good question because not everybody moves as fast as this. Some people come in and they're smoldering, smoldering and waiting for you to give them a diagnosis. Some people are going on for weeks. Like I said, you see the guy who goes to his primary care doctor, oh, my sinus is just so bad. I've been tricking all this medicine. Can't seem to shake it up. So differential for um, antibiotic resistant sinusitis <laughs> is vasculitis. Any antibiotic resistant pneumonia or sinus problem, people are taking three courses of antibiotics in primary care, they've taken this one thing. In just begin to think there could be a vasculitis going on because you see it so commonly. And people are going from place to place getting antibiotics thinking that they're trying to treat, shake it off. And you do a CAT scan or something, it says, oh, sinusitis. Yes, that's a hallmark of a vasculitis that could be going on. Yes. Well, and I'll tell you, in the right picture, like I said, the clinical presentation, so you have sinus, and then, oh, by the way, think about the check their urine. Do a deep sick. Do a deep sick, and if you see blood, just send them to a pulmonology. In fact, don't waste pulmonology. Pulmonology here, they don't seem to think more of it. Uh, typically, it's a nephrologist, I would say. If you, if you say, say, look, I'm worried about this picture, what do you think? We always seem to biopsy. I've had to come to the office because their creatinine went up. And nobody knew. And then I see them and look at them. Oh, it's a guy that smoked for 20 years. And I say, oh, he's shown us about the COPD. I say, oh, nice. But then he tells you, I normally walk three miles a day with my COPD. But suddenly in the last two weeks, I can't seem to get my walk a block and I'm short of breath. And oh, I go check his urine. Blood. I spin it down. Look at it. Dysmorphic red cells. I say, what? So I check his anchors in my office. I say, ah, long shot. <laughs> I biopsy his kidney. Classic. He has uh, anchor vasculitis. He has necrotizing uh, GN in his kidney. 
And that's the hallmark. So you, you think, sorry, my dad, go ahead. So like from perspective, like when you text someone. Yes. And at the same time, I'm thinking about thinking like, like yes. you want to start to feel like something? No, but you go, so that's why we do the test. So it's some of these people you see and you treat them and they don't respond and you see there's urine and blood in their urine and you kind of suspect. They look stable at the time they're seeing you, send them to treat. You treat for the common things first. And then you check anchors. You know it takes four or five days to come back. And then you get the result back and say, wow, in the picture that I have a patient that has a pulmonary involvement and, and a renal involvement, this kind of cues in that there might be something beyond what I'm thinking is going on. That's why we do the test. It takes that long here as a send down. Some places, I don't know, if I have to find out what the experience on that place is, but it takes it. Yeah. Well, put it this way you have to have a home. It's just like you think somebody has a PE. What do you do? You put them on heparin while you're checking them out, correct? A steroids will not kill you. <laughs> if you I'm sorry? No, but if you, no, the GI bleed is not, okay, well that's a different presentation if you have GI bleed. Typically, that's not what you see, uh, though you can have GI bleed with vasculitis, but uh, it's not what you see. I'm talking about people with pulmonary hemorrhage, and if, if, so if they come to the ICU, the first thing your ICU people do is they bronch them, <laughs> and if they see diffuse pulmonary hemorrhage, they're, they're calling us on the phone, because they know that this is a diffuse hemorrhage that most likely could be a vasculitis. In that case, we don't miss those ones. We tend to get those ones. The inline ask you, somebody's bronching them and we're getting diagnosed. It's the ones that are walkie-talkie and coming to you in the office. That's the one we're missing. That's the one that is coming in and we don't see and we don't think about and we don't factor in that they could have some vasculitis going on and there are several of them we we'll see and miss either. So the disease is there. It's in our community. It's coming every day. In fact, yesterday I saw one came into the hospital service and sitting there for days, and, and creatinine is going up from 1.5 to 2.3 to 2, and they're giving her fluid and fluid, and she's not improving. And by the way, I'm short of bread, I'm short of bread, and lo and behold, they sent the anchors the day she came, thankfully somebody did it. Five days later, after creatinine has gone up to uh, almost three. Uh, it's back, MPO is off the chart, and they called yesterday, oh, oh we need to start to, uh, we gotta think about it from the get-go. All right. Yes. Well, that's a good question. Does what the the anchors? So, the, so the, the 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 anchors, the response. You know, when you treat, does it come down? Yeah. No. So that's the thing. Anchors are very interesting. The people have studied and said they're involved with disease itself, and some people have found that they don't really seem to be involved. They probably can be a evidence of disease and in some situations they could actually be the cause of disease but when you treat people with anchor vasculitis the response you're looking for is clinical improvement not that the anchor levels have dropped people used to think that anchors should drop and they were following that for a long time and kept on treating people but we found out that it's not the people can still have anchors circulating in their system after you've started them on immunosuppressive medications and clinically their symptoms have improved. So you don't chase anchors after you start treatment. It helps you in the diagnosis, but it's not a hallmark that you follow classically. And the jury is not out on this really because some people still think you should follow it. Some have looked at it close and said it doesn't probably help you after you started treatment. It helps with diagnosis. But I said the diagnosis ultimately is made with a kidney biopsy or a biopsy of some form to diagnose necrotizing glomerular nephritis. You have to have a biopsy. Though we suspect it, the hallmark that there's disease truly is when I do a kidney biopsy and I see evidence that there's, there's um, anchor vasculitis happening in my kidney. Does that make sense? Uh, I'm confusing you guys more. Anyway, the treatment is high dose steroids when they come in and we start with steroids as well as cytotoxic therapy. It used to be that cytoxin was a hallmark medicine. We used that with the uh, cytoxin cyclophosphamide. We used that with high dose steroids as an induction and you, after six months, we move on to maintenance medicines, typically with uh, azotioprim. Azotioprim is the one we use most. Some people use methotrexate, but azotioprim with cytoxin and high dose was, was the mainstay of treatment for a long time. But recently, since 2010, rituxan has become a very effective medicine that we found that can have activity with anchor vasculitis. 
and actually FDA approved in 2010 to use in this disease. So rituxan is less benign, or rather uh, not as toxic in some sense compared to cytoxan. And that's why we had to find something different. Cytoxan is very toxic, you know that. Of course, the bone marrow suppression onto the, to the uh, infertility problems that happen and to the risk of cancer in the future. Those are risks you, you expose people to when you put them on cyclophosphamide. But with rituxan, there are some risks, but not as bad compared to this. And our elderly population can handle it probably better than your cy cyclophosphamide. Um, it's all with steroids. With rituxan, you might not need any maintenance. It's just a one-time treatment, and you kind of watch them, they improve. Uh, but with cyclophosphamide, you probably need maintenance with that. All right. Um, plasma pheresis is only used if there is severe alveolar hemorrhage in anchor disease. You pheres at that point. Or if they're getting dialysis dependent, those are the two conditions where you use plasma pheresis for anchor vasculitis, okay? So relapse 30 to 40% in, in five years. Uh, quickly, let's talk about your hereditary nephritis. They like this also in your body. Your Alport and your thin membrane disease. Those are your two big diseases that you talk about. Alport syndrome, uh, glomerular disease plus sensorineural deafness, and also involvement with uh, the eyes also in terms of lenticonus deformity in the eyes, sometimes some esophageal and uh, problems also. But the big association is with glomerular disease and sensorineural deafness. That's what you find out for. The problem is when you have a um, defect in the arrangement of the collagen in the, uh, in the glomerular basement membrane. So specifically as gene mutation of the uh, collagen uh, for uh, alpha 5 uh, uh, configuration. Like I told you, the collagen 4 is made of a triple helix. It has the alpha 3, alpha 4, and alpha 5, and the triple helix makes the bond strong, and it, m it forms in your GBM. If you have a defect in the production of one of those chains in the triple helix, typically is the alpha 5 chain is the big guy. Alpha 5 chain is notorious with X-link alpha because it's the gene is in the X chromosome. And that's the one that in more than 75% to 80% of the cases, it's normally alpha 5 chain that's involved. You can have problems with alpha 3 and alpha 4. They don't typically progress to alport or end-stage renal disease like alport we do. Those ones will manifest as your thin membrane, thin membrane disease. The, the membrane is thin. The glomerular basement membrane is thin. But they don't progress like alports will do. Alports a problem with the alpha 5 chain. And you need to know the gene. It's always in your body. The coal 4A5. Memorize it. <laughs> That's the one that will cause problems with Alport syndrome, typically. Um, so Alport is around us. Mm, I have a patient or two now that have Alport. It's common. It's not terribly common, but it's there. And you see people develop this deafness. So if you have somebody who's deaf and they have kidney disease, you always have to have a high suspicion of that uh, output because there's different degree of expression, especially if that person is a male. Some people start up when they're very young. Some people start up older in life, but you need to think about it in your practice when you're assessing somebody with worsening kidney function. Or, oh, by the way, I'm going deaf. Think output. There are several questions you're going to see in your board. That is and the diagnosis is kind of um, uh, tricky, but it has to do with staining for this alpha uh, type of collagen and trying to figure out if that alpha-5 component of that chain is defective. So even on the kidney biopsy, we can stain for, 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 for the alpha-5 chain to be sure that it's there or not there. And sometimes in your books, you read about skin biopsies to diagnose output. You need to know about it. I don't know the extent they expect you to know it, but for nephrologists, they probably want us to know the details of diagnosis of output because you need to preside over diagnosis in some situations, okay? Um, it can... Um, the other thing I wrote there was uh, can develop some uh, an airport patient who are lacking this alpha 5 chain. <coughs> when you think about it, when they progress, and they do progress, they progress to end stage renal disease. Most of them that start young, by the time they're in their mid 30s, are end stage renal disease, and they are needing kidney transplant. And they can't get kidney transplant. The problem is that when you transplant somebody whose body does not recognize a chain of collagen, Think of the problem. You take somebody with a normal kidney that has that chain that your body never knew of before, and you transplant it into them. 
your body will see that chain of collagen as, hmm, I don't know this chain. And this chain is something that they can react to and form antibodies to. And remember your anti-GBM? It's the same thing. Anti-GBM is now you expose, you expose that collagen to the body, and the body can develop antibodies to that chain, alpha-5 chain, and they can develop de novo anti-GBM disease after transplant. It's a small amount, maybe 5 to 10% of people can do that. So it's not the overwhelming majority, but some, when you hear of post-transplant anti-GBM disease, <coughs> it has to do with an Alport patient <coughs> that got a kidney and the body developed autoantibodies to that chain that was missing in their system. Because the body never recognized it at all. Does that make sense? Okay. Confuse me some more. <laughs> you need to read. All right. Um, I think that's the bulk of what I wanted us to talk about. I know I'm taking your time, but if you, there are some questions that we did two of these questions, but I have some questions here. Let's see. We did this two the last time. I have um, the three more that I just wanted us to look at. Uh, this was, go ahead, go ahead, stop change. We did one and two, if I remember correctly. And uh, we'll do three next. But does anybody have any question? How confused are you on the scale of one to ten? These topics are very big. There are things you have to refresh, but I just kind of give a schema of what you need to know about some of the nephritic syndromes that we have in the lupus, the alports, and the rapidly progressing ones, the anti-GBMs and the anchor disease. Those ones, I think, are things you will see in your boards with diseases that they will tell stories about and you can probably spot diagnosis about. Who wants to attack this one? Okay, should I pick somebody? All right, let me read it. Maybe somebody give you an answer. So you have a 42-year-old female who's three months of progressive cervical lymphadenopathy. She has fatigue, night sweat. She has diagnosed with stage three Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay, her labs creatinine is 1.3. She has blood in her urine. She has proteinuria, four plus proteinuria, four plus. Mark that word, four plus. And then there's some dysmorphic red cells, and a urine protein creatinine ratio shows what 9.25 grams now when you get to 9.25 grams of protein is that small proteinuria or is that massive proteinuria ah, i'm glad we can agree <laughs> so massive proteinuria so what is the most likely cause of this lady having massive proteinuria what do you think causing an nephrotic syndrome somebody said minimal change no nobody everybody's answer who she said minimal change okay what about fsgs Okay, any takers with FSGS? No, you take? Okay, brave so. Uh, IgA nephropathy. So is IgA typically nephrotic or nephritic? So it's typically nephritic, but you can have nephrotic syndrome with IgA. Like I told you, those diseases don't know, they can present different patterns, but mostly it's nephritic. And this patient, um, um, having nine grams proteinuria is not, it's clearly a nephrotic syndrome. Uh, Membrane or so, why is this not membranous? Membranous, any taker? Cancer, membranous? Oh, uh, so you got that point. Very good. So the answer is, let's find out what the answer is. Uh, there's no voting. So it's minimal change. A and <laughs> she probably paid attention last time. Uh, <laughs> so I, I don't know. But the, the, the reason is because of the type of cancer you're saying. It's Hodgkin's. Like I told you, if you remember, if we said the last time, people that have uh, some hematopoietic type cancers, <coughs> Hodgkin's, C, uh, uh, leukemias, they tend to typically have minimal change with their presentation of nephrotic syndrome, as opposed to solid tumors, like I have breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer. Those kind of people tend to typically have what? Membranous. Membranous those with those solid type tumors. Okay, all right. Let's see the last, the next one. I'm almost done, people. All right, somebody read. There's no somebody here. All right.
<laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Time off. <laughs> All right. So, sorry, C3 is 71, and normal is about 100. Okay? So, it's low. Okay? And C4 is, I gave it normal there, so it's 7. Okay? And that's low, too. So, C3 and C4 is low. Okay? Yeah, these kind of wicked questions they like to ask on the board, you know. They throw in this patient whose creatinine is normal and then comes in with some bad disease in the ICU. And then you treat him with all this medicine that can do damage to the kidney. And, and it has diseases also that can be dam cause damage to the kidney. And then they want you to pick out, oh, how, which one is likely doing it. And like, you're kidding, huh? How am I going to know which one? That's why you're learning. They throw out some. And so what you're going to see, you have to pay attention to things that they throw out and give you signal. All right. So what's the likely diagnosis of, or cause of AKI? Is this acute interstitial nephritis? Uh, who says yes? Can it be acute interstitial nephritis? Is there any medicine there that can do acute interstitial nephritis? Which one? Bactrim? Yeah, you have penicillin G. So yeah, so you see those stuff. So ca can it be that credit went up? So it could, but typically in the questions, they will tell you some things about them. So they say rash, you say eosinophilia, or say this kind of dangerous words that we like to hear. You know? uh, so rash is going to, but this patient did not, they didn't tell you that. Okay, all right? Okay, so we, we, it's a possibility, but let's look at the other possibility. Collapsing FSGS. Can this be collapsing FSGS? Possible. Why? Why do you say possible? They have HIV. Okay. Means that you didn't pay attention in my last lecture. <laughs> Why is this not collapsing? What? Say it. The proteinuria is just two point. It's not even nephrotic. Two point three grams of protein. And collapsing FSGS is like mi minimal. It's going to pour 10, 20 grams for you. That's how much they're dumping and collapsing. Collapsing is just a bad boy. It just dumps all the protein. All right? Uh, so unlikely. Unlikely collapsing. But, okay? Uh, immune complex mediated GL. That's a complex word. But can this be immune complex? Okay? Why? It's, it's, not, it's not D. It says not D. Okay. So okay, let's come to D. Why is it not D? All right, so it's not D because you, you hope they're not having, what things do pigmented injury to the kidney? Of course, we didn't talk about it. What? So rhabdo is one of them. What else? So rhabdo, what's the pigment? Myoglobin, okay. Which other thing does pigment injury? I'm sorry? Which other? Now, myoglobin is one of the pigments, yes. In, I'm talking about innate things in your body that can cause damage that are pigmented. So, you said my, oh, sorry, yeah, hemoglobin. Okay, yeah. So, if not myo, it's hemo, his brother. Okay, hemoglobin. What else can do pigment injury? I'm sorry? Bilirubin. That's the three you need to know. See all these people that call us on consult and their liver disease and their bilirubin is up to 20, 25, and they have AKI. It's peeling a lot. Eventually, it's going to talk to pigment injury to the kidney. Okay? So, we don't have this here. So, immune complex. Who says immune complex? Oh, hands are going on. So, why do you say immune complex? So, sorry. Complements are low. See, you always have to take what they gave you. Complements are low. Once you see complements are low, just go down and look for whatever is immune complex there and check that. <laughs> Well, no, I'm yeah. so, so like I said, in class four, but in class four lupus, class, class five lupus is membranous. Typically, you have membranous with more proteinuria. But that's the story for that will fit. But I'm saying this story where you have all these kind of possible toxins. There's a lot of things that I can do in immune complex. HIV can do disease to the kidney other than HIV-associated nephropathy. You can have immune complex injury from HIV. CMV can do immune complex injury to the kidney. Remember I told you? 
immune complex disease that we talked about, MPGM pattern, a lot of diseases that can be chronic can do it. CMV can do it. And clearly, once you start seeing the C3, C4, because none of the other things we do C3, C4 low, nothing else. In your acute interstitial, you should, not, you should have normal complements. In your collapse in FSGS, you should have normal complements. But once you start seeing complements low, see, that's a hallmark of this question. Everything is said, but only those complements low gives you the answer. Okay, last one. And then we're, we're so see, immune complex from what? MPG due to HIVs, syphilis. Oh, yeah, syphilis too. I didn't remember I had syphilis. Too. Yeah. All right, last one and we're done. Sorry, I'm taking all your time. Who wants to do this? Oh, no, I have one after this. Okay. Okay, 72 year old hypertension, BPH, admitted three months, progressive dyspnea, edema, right flank pain. Um, comes in and the blood pressure is a little high, breath, breath sounds are okay, chest x ray shows some mild pleural effusion. Um, creatinine is up to two and has three plus proteins and has an ultrasound with a kidney size of 12. And, and there's also finding of renal vein thrombosis on that kidney ultrasound. And uh, what's the likely diagnosis? Somebody said B. B. Oh, who said B? Why? You were listening. <laughs> you were listening. I told you. So tell them why. Once you see any GN question and they use the word, oh, I have renal vein thrombosis, just go down to the answer <laughs> and look for membranous. For your level, that's what it is. Now, membranous is not the only thing that can give you clots. Any massive proteinuria disease can give you blood clots. In other words, people will collapse in FSGS, people will even minimal change. But membranous in particular is the disease that clots tend to occur. And more association with membranous with clots. So once you see a blood clot, DVT, typical renal vein, just check membranous, okay? Just keep going. Is there any more? Oh, there's one last one. I'm sorry, I lied. <laughs> this is the last one. All right, who's doing this one? Someone from the back. Covio. Just read it. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. You're sick. <laughs> All right, we'll give it a pass. 33-year-old, living on later kidney transplant two weeks ago, and cigarette disease due to FSGS. And he's on ProGraph, and he's on MMF and all the good medicines. And then comes in because creatinine is 1.7, glucose is normal, of oh, so good. Four plus protein, look at that. After two weeks, having gotten a kidney transplant, gets four plus protein, little blood. So what is the likely diagnosis? 33 year old guy. I'm sorry? Somebody said something, you said. You're the answer, oh, but not you. <laughs> you keep all the answers. Eh? Recurrent FSGS, so why do you say recurrent FSGS? Correct. So you have to remember the likelihood of recurrence. So client is not diabetic nephropathy. Two weeks, you can't get diabetic in two weeks because of your disease. IgA nephropathy can reoccur. IgA can reoccur. Used to be that was anything, but it can reoccur, but it's not this nephrotic. This guy has four plus proteinuria. So IgA is not nephrotic, it's more nephrotic disease. Uh, membranous can occur. De novo membranous in transplant is a common occurrence, but typically not within two weeks. It tends to occur after you've had that kidney for more than a couple of years. And, but recurrent FSGS, yeah, baby, that can occur from the day. In fact, the surgeons are hooking up the kidney and the urine is coming out and all you see is just foamy urine. That's how fast FSGS could recur in people and some people just hook up the kidney and they happen. Some of them are going from OR to plasma right away. Okay? And that will be the end of this.